This is Free to Exchange, the show where free markets and free thinking scholars meet. I'm your host, Ben Powell. Just over 100 years ago, the Soviets came to power in Russia and implemented the first large-scale socialist economy in history. 100 years later, the Soviet Union's gone and socialist systems around the globe have collapsed. Only a few remain. Venezuela is one of them. The theme of today's show is socialism then and now. We'll begin by discussing how socialism functioned in the Soviet Union. Then, in the second half of the show, we'll turn our attention to the havoc that socialism is causing in Venezuela today. My first guest is Dr. Peter Betke. Dr. Betke is the University Professor of Economics and Philosophy at George Mason University and BB&T Professor for the Study of Capitalism at the Mercatus Center at GMU. He's the author of numerous books, most recently, F.A. Hayek, Economics, Political Economy, and Social Philosophy. In the past, he's also published books on the political economy of Soviet socialism and why perestroika failed, both of which are obviously relevant for our discussion today. Pete, welcome back to the show. Well, thanks, Ben. Glad to be here. So let's start. There's a lot of confusion today when I hear particularly young people saying that they like socialism. I don't think they know what the heck it is. So what's the defining characteristic of, that makes an economy socialist? So, uh, defining characteristic of a socialist economy is that it has state ownership of the means of production, and a communist economy would have communal ownership of the means of production. So socialism is the first stage, and then you would then move on to communism. Okay, so let's just unpack this for a second. The, the means of production, what we're talking about here is the factories, the raw materials, and for that matter, even the workers, right? Right. Private property. That's the key thing. Private property would be abolished, and then state ownership would take over that, and then eventually communal ownership because there would no be, in the communist future, there wouldn't be any permanent bureaucracies. We would be rotating in and out, and so then the community owns it. So it's a misnomer to call the Soviet Union communist then? Well, or it's either a misnomer or it's that communism in operation is the same as socialism because the community is the state, right? And then the state, that's why totalitarian regimes end up by being the way they are. They start out by trying to be this march into freedom, but then they have to give total control over to the state and then the state ends up by being the community. That's what it means to be totalitarian. So actually, let's touch on that connection a little bit more for a sec before we go on with the history. That why does it have to be that it ends up with totalitarian control? Why isn't it that the workers just can't cooperate and plan their production? Well, the biggest problem that socialism faces um, is that uh, even if you assume that everyone was rightly motivated, they wouldn't know how to organize their affairs, and so they, engage, they can't engage in rational economic calculation. Um, this is one of the great insights of Ludwig von Mises, whose face you have there in his famous book, Socialism, identified because they ha the system would have to forego the intellectual division of knowledge in a society, intellectual division of labor. <clears throat> and so now you've given people a tremendous amount of power to make decisions, they're supposed to make these decisions. They're unable to make those decisions based on economic criteria. So how are they going to make the decisions? They end up by making them on bureaucratic or political criteria. And that's one of the reasons why the state gets more and more and more involved and more entrenched um, in all of the different socialist experiments that we've seen everywhere. Right. So it's the necessity to coordinate across the economy that without private property and prices, they can't do. So it ends up becoming... Yeah. The state. Now, let's go to the Soviet Union then and, and dial back 100 years. Uh, all systems that we've seen in the world, whether capitalist or socialist, are, aren't pure forms of each other. Right. It's kind of a gradient. Uh, when the Soviets first came to power in the Soviet Union, how close to pure socialism did they get? What was it like there? Well, you have you have to remember it's a context right after World War One, so there is a kind of you know chaos still going on of things. The 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 regime that. Lenin and the, and the Bolsheviks ended up by overturning, had already started to go through a crisis. So it's not like they came in and it was a pure, unadulterated experiment. But, you know, on the very first day that Lenin's in power, he stands in front of the podium and he says, now we will construct socialism and just leaves. He doesn't say anything else. No, big. that's all he said. Now we will construct socialism. And the very next day, they sent out the decrees and they start sending out all of their decrees to abolish private property, to, to abolish exploitation, to do all these things. And there's these set of decrees. 
And between, you know, November, October, because it's a different calendar, right. uh, November and June, so November of 1917 to June of 1918, uh, there's not, they're not involved in war. There's no trying to retrench or anything like that. In June of 1918, they have to end up by going to war. Okay, and they have a civil war to protect themselves. But all of the policies, if you study the policies between November and June, they were all consistent with the Marxist Leninist idea of abolishing private property and means of production, abolishing the market economy, substituting in for it the state planned economy. And they, they tried to what they did was follow a, a roadmap that was written by two economists. Priya Brzezinski and Nikolai Bukharin called the ABCs of communism. And they try to follow it to a, to a T. And then the war breaks out and they continue to constant, you know, centralize. Uh, but a lot of people, historians say, oh, that's because of the wartime or whatever. But then they solve, they have a peace in October of 1920. And after the peace, they continue to socialize even more. Right. The early famines pre-Stalin, this is yeah. after that war. It's under Leonard, this is, when is he collectivizing the farms and requisitioning the, the grain? Yeah, in the so early during 20s? war communism, which is during the 1918 to 1921, is the war communism period. But the Civil War is settled in 1920, October of 1920. But after they already you know, solve the Civil War, they actually adopt a policy to nationalize all firms with five employees or more. All firms in the, in, the, in the entire Russian economy are now nationalized, and that's after. And, you know, they have all these plans about electrification and all these, you know, big, big plans. Well, that collapses. That economy completely collapses, and the Bolsheviks are threatened with losing power. And in the spring of 1921, they simultaneously do two things. One of them is they free up the economy. And one of the main things that they did was they changed their tax system from an arbitrary tax to a fixed tax. And now, like, the farmers could calculate, you know, what we're going to do and, and, and because they knew they could only, they only, the government can only take a certain percentage. Before it was just requisition, we'll take some of Anything your stuff. Anything they could get, and... which led to very interesting phenomena, too, which is that, you know, the army would be marching. Rumors would happen that the army was coming to get your, you know, livestock or your uh, grains, and they would either eat them all up or burn them. You know, so then the army would get there and be, you know, not have any of the the resources that they were trying to gather for the war. Um, and anyway, the in the spring of two, 1921, they simultaneously adopted the new economic policy, which ironically. Nikolai Bukharin, who was the architect of war communism, was also the architect of NEP. And when he introduced NEP, he actually makes reference to Mises. Because prior to World War I, uh, Bukharin, as part of the Marxist international revolutionary movement, was sent to Vienna to study the Austrian economists because they were the most learned critics of communism with from Eugen von Bavorek and Mises. And, and so he actually wrote a whole book on the Austrians critical of them. And when he introduced new economic policy in Russia, he says that Ludwig von Mises, this is a direct quote, Ludwig von Mises, the most learned critic of communism, is right for the moment. We can't go to full socialism right now, but we'll have the last laugh because after a generation, we'll now better know how to plan and then we could you know, laugh back at Mises. But at the same time they introduced the market economy, they suppressed all political opposition. So it's this combination of giving back some private property rights, but then suppressing their ability to then express their political desires with their new wealth and property that would threaten the party's success. And that's how you get the kind of Soviet system that you got. And this is when Stalin comes into power at this point then, and we go through yeah. the 30s, forced industrialization, economic stagnation relative to the United States. Let's fast forward all the way for our last few minutes here to the 1980s, Gorbachev's yeah. in power, perestroika. What is it? What's the effect? So perestroika literally means restructuring. Glasnost, which is the other half of that, means public frankness. They were going to be honest about things, transparency. But the perestroika is the restructuring of the economy. And what Gorbachev tried to do was introduce uh, partial reforms. 
uh, give some private property rights back, uh, give some uh, economic decision power back. And, but the, it was always a mixed bag of things. So, uh, you know, he had the law of cooperatives, which allowed people to now sell in a private market, but they taxed it at a different rate than what they would have done had they not sold it for profit. And so the Soviet joke was a state shortage of buns and a state shortage of sausage becomes a sandwich sold out the back window because they tried to avoid taxation. For an economist like you or I, this is a fascinating thing, but it's also very predictable because they just were incentive incompatible policies that they were trying to do. But that all unwinds by the end of the 1980s. And then you have the 1991 attempted coup and then uh, you know, Yeltsin comes in and then you have the post-Soviet era is born. So in, a, in the last minute or so here then, boil down ultimate failure of the Soviet Union and the collapse of it, what's the fundamental cause? Anytime you try to abolish private property, you're going to have incentive problems and you're going to have knowledge problems that your economy can't uh, function. And then the state tries to step in and do more and more and more and take away our freedoms. And we end up by losing our freedoms and losing our prosperity. And so socialism is, uh, has wrecked ha havoc on human civilization. Well, thank you, Pete. Despite this widespread failure, socialism remains popular with many people today. 20 years ago, the people of Venezuela democratically elected a new socialist regime. Our next guest lived in socialist Venezuela, and we'll talk about what that was like. Stick around. This program is made possible in part by a grant from the Helen Jones Foundation, supporting education and the fine arts in keeping with the philosophy of Helen DeWitt Jones, who devoted her later life to sharing her wealth as a patron of philanthropic causes. The Helen Jones Foundation. Founded in 2013, the Free Market Institute at Texas Tech University promotes the teaching and study of free market economics. As part of our programming, we sponsor a public lecture series open to students, faculty, staff, and the general public in the Lubbock community. Often, the speakers in that series are the guests that you see right here on Free to Exchange. More information is available at www.fmi.ttu.edu or by email at free.market at ttu.edu. Welcome back. Joining me now is Dr. Rafael Acevedo. Dr. Acevedo is a research associate with Texas Tech's Free Market Institute, and he's the founding director of Econentech, a nonpartisan economic think tank based in Venezuela. Prior to coming to Texas Tech, he was also a professor back in Venezuela. Rafael, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. So when people see Venezuela on the news today, they see uh, stories of famines and of riots and of uh, a collapsing economy, but it wasn't always like that. Let's take it back a little while. What was Venezuela like 40, 50 years ago? Okay, I, I went to recover Venezuela 60 years ago. In January 1958, uh, Venezuela was a newborn democratic republic. Uh, before that, we, 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 we were ruled by dictatorships, but we enjoyed a, a high level of economic freedom. We had uh, the great performance in, in, in the economy, in our economy. Uh, people wanted to go to Venezuela. Uh, a, a, a great migration from Europe uh, uh, was in, in those years, in the 1950s. We, we had a great real GDP per capita, uh, an economic miracle. We, we were known like an economic miracle in that moment. Yeah, as I recall, the, the in the late 1960s, maybe 1970, Venezuela was richer than Spain itself, right? Yes, of course, but that, that the, the result of, of the previous uh, years, 1958 and before. Mm -hmm. So then starting in the late 60s, early 1970s, till, up till 1998, before you actually got Chavez in a socialist government, what, what happened to Venezuela? Yes, you're talking about the democratic era, the 40 years of democratic uh, the, of social democracy and the social Christianism in Venezuela. In 1959, uh, started the first uh, democratic uh, uh, president in Venezuela, Romulo Betancourt. He was social democrat, but he, he started to implement the, uh, the socialist agenda. So he, he kidnapped all the, the economic freedoms that we had. Uh, of course, they implemented a, a high political freedom, but the cost 
of that political freedom was the, the economic freedom. So Venezuelans they started to apply uh, socialist policies. For example, free, free education, um, a free health care, uh, the right to job, uh, free housing, etc. That, that kind of, of promises that all socialists uh, are, are, are promising in this moment in, in every country. Okay? Uh, in, when, when, when you start to apply the, the socialist agenda in Venezuela, all the progress, all the economic um, development that we reached before the 1958 started to decrease. Okay? So at this point, Venezuela wasn't socialist per se. It was just starting to piecemeal adopt policies, maybe Fabian socialism, yes. of getting bigger and bigger welfare states, smaller freedoms. And this, where does this leave you in 1998 then? What is Venezuela's economy like? What is living standards like just before Chavez? Yes. Well, be before Chavez, uh, we were better than, than we are in, that, in, in this moment, of course. But uh, the problem was the, 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 the decrement that we were suffering in, in, in the economy and, and, and in our economic uh, welfare. Okay. Um, the socialist agenda implemented by Romulo Etancourt and any other uh, presidents in Venezuela uh, was similar than the, un uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, for example, uh, we, we had uh, a central planning economy ministry. So, so the gap between poor and, and rich is increasing a lot. In that moment, 40 years after those, those, uh, those problems, corruption, uh, influence, uh, all that kinds of, uh, of problems that has uh, the, the, the socialism, uh, it's not a surprise that an outsider, political outsider like Hugo Chavez, uh, was the winner of, of, the, uh, of the presidency. Right. So it's in that context. Hugo Chavez gets democratically elected. Everybody thought it was a fair election. Of course. And he promises we're going to do Bolivarian socialism, right? Yes. What, what does that mean? What changed from before with once he was in? The Bolivarian uh, socialism is the same, the same thing, that the socialism. Okay, but uh, Chavez, Chavez arrived to the power in a moment uh, of when, when Venezuela don't believe the, the people in Venezuela don't don't believe don't trust on the political parties, the the economic uh, elites and the political elites and the social media elites uh, boosted Chavez because they maybe they think that that they will have a, a puppet in the, in the presidency. But the problem is that Chavez has highly related with Fidel Castro's project. So um, Chavez, Chavez promised a lot, but was the same, the pr same promises that Venezuelans believed in 1958. In, in terms of what policies did he change? How much more socialist did Venezuela become because of Chavez? Did he nationalize? Bigger businesses, yes. outlaw other businesses, price control things. What were the, the differences? Of course. Uh, Chavez uh, started to uh, change the constitution. We had a, a constitution, 1961, socialist cost constitution, but the, the Chavista constitution was harder. Okay? Uh, he changed the, 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 the private property, jeopardized a lot uh, the private property, uh, started to, to privatize. Uh, to, to, to um, to expropriate a lot of uh, of companies of enterprise, I started all this process of the state-owned companies. Um, uh, also, he he has, uh, he started to to jeopardize more the economic freedom. Uh, implemented a lot of controls, exchange controls, price controls, rent controls. That. By the way, uh, we're not the, the first time in Venezuela because we, we had a exchange control before Chavez. But in this moment, it was, uh, was stronger than, than before. Right. So on the first half of the show, my guest and I had talked about how there's no pure system of pure capitalism or pure socialism in the world. It's always mixed but a matter of degree. And it sounds like under Chavez, the nationalization of more businesses, expropriation of them, it became more state-owned. Mm -hmm. And... For those that were nominally private, they lost control of business decision making because of the, the regulation. But the socialists in the United States and uh, other people observing this during Chavez's life were saying, look, this is democratic socialism and it works. 
They said it's democratic and they're prospering. What, okay. What's wrong with this? Well, I think that, uh, that when those socialists uh, talked about Venezuela, they were talking when, when the boom of the oil prices, okay? Chavez enjoyed the, the highest prices of the history in Venezuela, uh, but they used it to implement their, their socialist agenda, their, their, their project. Um, the, the, very, the, the result, the, the, the real result of the socialism is the misery and the slavery of the, the, the society, because they need a, a slave society to, to, to maintain the control, to maintain the power. Right. So what we were observing then, Venezuela has the, the world's largest, I think, proven oil reserves. Yes, right? more than Saudi, Saudi Arabia. Arabia. More than Saudi Arabia. So when oil prices were high, he could give away freebies and make people look better. Yes. But it wasn't the economy actually working. What's happened to the economy since oil prices have gone down? What's, what's the problem? When you have a central plan in, in this, a, a big state, a great state, what, how, how uh, we have in Venezuela, it's very difficult, the, the entrepreneurism and the private sector uh, to, to take the, 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 the control and, and, and you know everything that take the power, take the, the state, is, it's condemned to, the fa to failure. So what's, what's the problem in Venezuela, the, the real problem? The, the great is the size of the, of the government, uh, the socialist agenda, at this moment we have no freedom no economic freedom, no political freedom also, because the democracy was, was thrown away. Well, let, let's come to the democracy in, in just a minute. Let's stick with what's happening in the economy there, because you just recently moved here to the United States. Yes. So not only are you an economist who can talk about what state control does, but you observed it. What's it like for normal Venezuelans trying to, to live their lives under, under this system today? Well, it's very difficult to be to, to live in, in Venezuela in this moment. In this moment, uh, the Venezuelan people is suffering, is surviving, no, no living, is surviving the, the worst misery that, that any human being can, can, can support. Um, each day you, you will be worse than before because you can afford the same, the same basic food, the same basic me medicines. You, you cannot be a, a good supplier for your family. And that's, that is the, the, the result of all these policies that I, I were applied in, in, in my country. Because the, the food and the medicine is just not there to buy? No, you, you cannot buy for, for twice. Be, because if you find it's very expensive, and you are talking in, in, of a country where the, the, the average people uh, maybe has a, an income of $3 monthly, in the exchange rate, the, the black market exchange rate. And second, you can have money. If you have money, uh, the, the few people that can, can have money, uh, you can find the, the food, you can find the medicines. So it's, it's, it's a, a, a situation, a worse situation in Venezuela, right? very hard to, to our people. So this is an important point I think you're making. When people see Venezuela on the news and they hear that people are, are losing weight and can't get food, I think it's easy for a lot of them to think, well, this is just, this is third world poverty. But what you're describing is happening to middle class, upper class Venezuelans too. Of course, look at this. Uh, when Chavez arrived to the power, so, some indexes say, okay, now it's more flat, the difference between poor and, and medium class. But the problem was that the medium class practically disappeared from Venezuela. The professional medium class disappeared and now is poor. The richest will ever be richest. Okay, but the problem was the medium class. In this moment, everybody is in extreme poverty. Eighty percent of the of the population in Venezuela is in the extreme poverty. That's that that's the the statistics that the, the, the this tyranny in Venezuela doesn't want to, to to say. Yeah. So in just these last few seconds, then, if eighty percent are in poverty like this, they've got to be discontent. Venezuela is still a democracy. How come they just don't vote the leader out of power now? Well, is it still democratic socialism or is it no longer democratic? No. Last, last few seconds. Yes, no. In Venezuela, the, the socialism changed from, so, from democratic socialism. Now we are in the communism. We, we have a dictatorship that is recognized in all international spheres. Vice President Pence and President Trump have said that 
the um, Venezuelans have suffered in the dictatorship, the worst dictatorship of, 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 of the Americas in this moment. Tremendous tragedy. Thank you for joining and talking about Thank it. Thank you very much. Everywhere that socialism's been tried, it's led to economic stagnation and political tyranny. It's no accident. Once private property is abolished, people lose their ability to have decentralized coordination through their economy. But in order to have a high standard of living, you have to coordinate the different sectors. That means without prices and profit and loss to do it, somebody has to make a plan and tell everybody what to do. That involves centralizing power to the government. Once that happens, incentive and informational problems kick in that lead to the economic stagnation. And with that centralized power and economic power comes political power and political repression. This was true in the old Soviet Union. It's true in Venezuela today. It's true everywhere else where socialism's been tried. Advocates of democratic socialism mistakenly think that they can have the benefits of democracy and bottom-up coordination without actually a process that can coordinate. Advocates of democratic socialism today don't start out wanting political tyranny and economic stagnation, but that's where they're going to end up. I'll see you next time.